founder and co-head at TIFF. Welcome to a masterclass with filmmaker Ramin Barani. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment just to reflect on where we are. Here in Toronto, we're located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. These lands are protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and are home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We're grateful to be working on this land and we encourage you to reflect on the land where you're located as well. I'd also like to thank the people who, and the organizations who make everything we do at TIFF possible. Our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris and Visa, and the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. TIFF's industry programming is generously supported by Ontario Creates and Telefilm Canada. And this masterclass is presented in partnership with Netflix and will stream by YouTube and TIFF Industries Facebook and Twitter channels. I am so happy to be speaking with Ramin Barani today. He's a groundbreaking and award-winning writer, director, and producer of films such as Man Push Cart, Chop Shop, Goodbye Solo, and 99 Homes. And in 2010, the legendary film critic Roger Ebert called him the director of the decade. Well before today's debates about inequality in society, Ramin was making films that told those stories brilliantly. He's done it again in this year's awards contender, The White Tiger, bringing to the screen Aravind Adiga's pride, prize-winning story of an Indian servant's rise to power. Ramin, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much. Great to see you. Great to see you too, and thanks so much for doing this. Congratulations on The White Tiger. has been nominated for awards at the Oscars, the BAFTAs, the Independent Spirit Awards, the Writers Guild of America. The themes that I found in the film resonate with, with your other work, but this feels like it's a very different project for you. You're adapting a contemporary novel and you're shooting in one of the most populous, complex countries in the world. I know you and the, the novelist have been friends for years, but how did you first approach this project and deciding to make it into a film? Yeah, um, Arvind and I, Arvind Nadiga, the author, and I have been friends since college. We we went to Columbia University together in the 90s, and there was a group of us, um, Iranians, Indians, uh, Afghans, Syrians, Lebanese, that found one another and, and befriended each other. And Arvind and I became friends probably more closely because he wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be a, a filmmaker. And most immigrants or children of immigrants are kind of funneled into a path of doctor, lawyer, engineer, and we were kind of the oddities. Um, he insists that our friendship was cemented through a screening of Mean Streets. Um, mm -hmm. I gathered a, a group of these guys to come to my dorm room to, to watch Mean Streets um, as the movie was boring to most of them. And I was talking during the entire film. They left except for Arvin. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I kept talking in the middle of the film, you know, this is a voiceover, this is why it's voiceover, this is a jump cut, mm -hmm. you know, um, things that I was learning and understanding from my time studying film theory. And Arvin was really interested in all this and, and saw something in the film. And, and so in a way our friendship was cemented through movies and it's still probably, we, we talk more about movies than we talk about books. Although we do talk a lot about books as well. Mm -hmm. I wanna ask you a bit about adapting his book into an, into a film because uh, you have known each other for so long and and obviously that friendship has been important creatively as well but adapting a novel is never easy and one of the hardest things is actually capturing the perspective the voice of the book and uh, i feel like you've done that so well here can you talk a little bit about how you approach that what decisions you made in terms of capturing the perspective of the the protagonist balram on screen yeah i mean um I had been reading the novel for a long time. I, I first got a rough draft of it, which I still had saved in my laptop in 2004. Wow. Four years before it was published. So I knew the book really, really well. And, um, you know, the first thing was just reading it um, two more times and taking a lot of notes before I started working. And, and his voice is kind of what makes it jump off the page. It's a first person narration. So you don't have access to other characters' thoughts. Um, you don't really know their backstories. In, in some cases, you just know the glimpses that Balram is able to hear or see or 
what he imagines them to be. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite tricky because you had to develop a lot of the characters or create them from scratch. And at the same time, the tone of, of the voiceover and the tone of the novel was probably the trickiest thing to do. And that's, I think, part of what maybe makes you say it's similar to my other films, but different in a way. And it's that tone that was so different because it has a abiding humor and a sarcasm. It has a playful quality, the book does. As you read it, you, you enjoy it. It's some, there's something fast and fun about it. And then in the, sec, in the middle of the novel, it, it breaks. Um, it's kind of broken in half. And, and in the second half, it becomes more hallucinatory. As we go into the, the nightmares he starts to have, or visions he starts to have, as he's kind of put under a lot of pressure and starts to contemplate a murder he's going to commit. Mm -hmm. um, this capturing this tone was to me the most important thing I wanted to do, and I felt the biggest challenge because I'd never done anything like that before. You said you you had been reading the book since before it was published, four years before. When did you know you were going to make it into a film? Did he approach you right away about that? No, I, I had always wanted to make it into a film, but. When the novel came out, it didn't quite seem like the right time. It was such a kind of huge moment in, in Arvin's life. You know, it was his first novel. There was so much going on with it. And it also seemed very unlikely to, to launch that movie at that time. Mm -hmm. A movie in India with an all Indian cast, you know, with significant portions of Hindi dialogue. And it's epic and huge. It was not a cheap movie to make. So the odds of making it then seem limited. And um, to be honest, I don't think I would have known how to make it at that time. Mm. That was, I had just finished Goodbye Solo, which you screened. I, yeah. I want to say thank you. You've been screening all my films since Chop Shop. And oh, yeah. You've been a real I, supporter. Yeah. You always. Yeah. And it's uh, always a pleasure to come there with my films to see you and screen the films. Um, in fact, at that moment when he won the Man Booker Prize, I was in London presenting Goodbye Solo. At the same time, we actually met Arvind and I the day after he got the award. I don't think creatively I would have known how to tackle it at that time. Um, what changed in the meantime? By the time you, you did uh, sign on to make it, what had changed for you? Well, I had made, um, I had made three more films. I had done one television pilot. And so I had gained a lot more experience, including from missteps. Those always teach you the most projects that you work hard on, but don't really turn out the way you hope they would. You end up learning a lot from those. And um, I don't know, I felt more confident as a director, um, more willing to take risks. You know, I remember actually I was at, at TIFF doing a week of um, teaching or, or working with young filmmakers and um, in my group of people was Claire Denis, um, which was amazing to me because God knows how I admired her films and how much I you know, grew up watching them. And then there she was. So her and I were talking about the freedom we feel in making films because there's no pressure of a uh, financier and is somebody gonna watch this one day and how will it recoup its money for the investors. You don't have to think about any of that. And both of us were talking about, and she has so much risk taking, but just how to translate that into feature films, you know, mm -hmm. that, that kind of freedom of, it doesn't really matter what happens. And I remember that conversation with her at, at TIFF and um, I've been searching for that kind of freedom of risk taking that I felt was in the novel also, you know, it was a risky book. And I think that comes out of, to some degree, out of the youthful time when he wrote it and the youthful time when I was making my first films where you didn't think much about anything. You just kind of made what you felt like mm -hmm. and just kind of recapture that energy. Hmm. I'm so glad to hear that and that you had that 
that connection with Claire Denis. Uh, that was our filmmaker lab, which we, we run every year during the festival for filmmakers uh, who are on their way uh, up in their careers. Uh, and I'm glad you're able to, to be a part of that. Um, I want to ask you about casting uh, the lead, about Adar Shkurov, who plays Bahram in the movie and who is fantastic and has gotten some awards attention for his uh, performance as well. Um, it wasn't that well known, I don't think, to audiences, especially outside of India. I think he's still fairly early in his career. That's a big role. Um, and I think he does so well, especially in that transformation from a fairly naive villager to a very cunning, urban, uh, sort of corporate predator in his own way. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you needed from him, the casting process, how you landed on him, and how you created that performance together? Yeah, he's awesome, Adarsh. And I think before I got to India, there were dialogues and conversations with um, some amazing actors in the Indian diaspora that I want to work with that you know, and, and they're phenomenally talented. But spending time in India doing the research and preparation, the more I was there, the more I felt the actor should come from India. Mm -hmm. And I kept hoping that, although I met with movie stars also in India who were incredible, the more I, I thought about it, the more I, I felt, God, I hope an unknown or a semi-unknown comes through the door one day that blows me away because it seemed like it would be a great trajectory for for the movie, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be, of course, you know, Marlon Brando's amazing and on the waterfront playing a, a, a working class, you know, anti-hero, which is a movie I love. Mm -hmm. um, but Adarsh came in the audition room one day in, in Mumbai and just, Immediately, I liked him. I remember turning to Tess Joseph, the casting director, and McCool, the producer, and just saying, this is the first person that's come in that could be Balram. And he he had a duality, which I needed. Um, when he smiled and, and talked, you immediately liked him. So he was immediately empathetic and charming. But then when it went to a serious scene, or when he was listening, if I was talking and he was listening, I thought, my God, he's actually listening. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what he's thinking, but he seems to have the ability to, he could go somewhere darker. You know, you could see it in him. There was something intense in his thinking. Mm -hmm. And I thought this duality would be perfect for the role. And um, when I like an, an actor in an audition, I like to go wildly off book. Um, to see what they'll do. And he was really good at that. He was really good at improvisation. He was really good at never being rattled by crazy things I might say as the other character. Um, he went with it. And I like that a lot. It gives me confidence and freedom in an actor. Um, I love being surprised by actors. It's my favorite thing on a set. When they say or do things that you never expected or their interpretation of a scene is completely different than what you've been imagining and somehow it works. I love that from actors. So he he had all those qualities, you know. Um, he's a fully trained actor. He had a, the, a scholarship to the best acting school in India. He had done some supporting roles with directors that I know, I think you like as well, like Anurag Kashyap. Yes. Yeah, Gangs of Lay mm -hmm. um, and so many other great films in India. Um, so he had that, but he had never done the lead and, and he, man, he invested himself into it. Um, yeah, he has this incredible kind of quicksilver quality, which partly is the character's demand as well. He responds to situations constantly and he's trying to navigate and shift as he goes. But if you feel like as an actor, he's got that as well. He just feels like he's, like you say, like alive to every moment in, in every scene. Which is totally, yeah. Rare. He spent two weeks in a village researching um, living anonymously there. He worked in a tea shop in India, in Delhi, for several weeks, getting paid like a nickel a day. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he actually, he, he did not show anyone his identity, which made it hard to get a job. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to show his name. He wanted, and he went introducing himself as Balram, mm -hmm. and he would get the costume from the costume designer. Mm -hmm. So he went dressed as a Balram, and, and um, it's an interesting story. He, he worked in this tea shop, for a couple of weeks and he, he, he and I had a great rapport whenever I was doing callbacks for other parts, mm -hmm. he would come. So he and I kind of rehearsed the movie through callbacks mm -hmm. and explored scenes in callbacks together. 
And so I texted him one time. He had a he had a burner phone. It had my number and his mom's number in case something happened. He didn't carry his normal. Yeah, when he went to this job, yeah. yeah. And so I texted him and I said, could you please come? I want you to do a callback with this other actor. But he didn't know how to get out of the job. <laughs> so he told the tea shop owner, I have to buy some bananas. Mm. And he went to buy the bananas. He started running and he ran and ran and ran all the way to the production office. <laughs> we did the callback. Of course, he lost that job. He couldn't go back to it because why had he left? Yeah. Now he's wandering around Delhi um, without his ID trying to get another job for a couple of days, but no one would hire him. Until one day, these men are loading some heavy, sharp metal into a truck. And they see him wandering around and they say, hey, come over here. And he goes over there. They don't say, would you like a job? And we're paying this much money to lift this um, uh, metal. They just said, pick this metal up and put it in this truck. Hmm. And he did it. (laughs) And his hands got torn up and they paid him a small sum of money. And that was that. And then he came to the office and we put some medicine for him. But it was amazing that he had found, he must have found some mood or atmosphere of being servant, low caste, invisible, that they didn't ask him if he wanted a job. They just said, do it. And he did do it. Right. They just assumed that someone who looked like him yeah. would do it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is part of, interestingly, kind of what a big part of the movie is about. Yes. Yes. Definitely. A man who has so much potential, but is trapped by his caste, his you know, his situation, his lot in life, mm-hmm. his race, religion. It could be so many other things in any country in the world. Hmm. Once you had cast Adarsh, were there things that you did in the production in terms of uh, just nailing the specifics of his different stages in in the story and costume, hair, his teeth, all of those kinds of things, uh, because he has very different looks and and people do read each other, like you're saying, uh, in India, based on how they're dressed, what they look like, how they're groomed, all of those kinds of things, I guess, as they do everywhere. Um, What was that part of it like, just creating his look? That was fun. I mean, we had, uh, you may know this, my cast, my crew, um, my cast was entirely Indian. My, my crew was 99% Indian. I brought only five people from the West. And um, so the costume designer, Samirti, did a phenomenal job with his costumes. And we talked about that transition of, he has this, uh, a, an important scene for him with Priyanka where she uh, chastises him for his pond stained teeth and he's touching his groin and he smells. And so he goes to the market to buy new clothes. So we talked a lot about what would those clothes look like and you know, when would he wear it? When is he dressed in the servant uniform? And then a lot about what he was going to look like as an entrepreneur three years later in Bangalore. I remember the initial costumes were um, a nice shirt, like maybe what you're wearing or a white shirt and a, and a suit, like a jacket. And I thought this is a little boring um, because he he's... Um, He's finally free to do what he wants and he may have wilder dreams. Mm-hmm. And so I remembered my friend Ahmed Razvi, who's the lead in Man Push Cart and is a supporting role in, in Chop Shop. He's a Pakistani guy who lives down the street from me here in Brooklyn. And when he would go out to the club, he always had some very wild shirt, mm-hmm. he had a ponytail. Yep. He said, my God, if I take Ahmed Razvi's look and I just amp it up a little bit, it could be really good. And so we gave him a ponytail. And we gave him a belly because he wants to have a big belly, which is a movie the film. And, and we kind of gave him this wild look of very cool shirts. And but he's free, you know. He he's a man who has a chandelier above his uh, uh, head in this office because he wanted a chandelier. Chandelier, yeah. He wanted one. <laughs> That's in the novel that he's like, I'm free. I should have a chandelier. Why and why shouldn't I have it? You know. So I you know. Thought- Reminded me of, and I, I don't know how you'll take this, but Scarface, the um, yeah, sure, the Scarface, you know, yeah, yeah because he he has money, he can get gaudy things, right. yeah, he can be yeah. as gaudy as he wants to be, you know? yes, yeah. And the other thing we talked about was um, something I learned from from Werner Herzog is he he's always asking his actors, you know, how are you going to move and walk, mm. and so that's a habit I've picked up of talking to my actors about how will they walk and. And what, what is the walk of this person? And Balram Adarsh, uh, Adarsh 
one day in a, in a call bank said, Rami, do you have some time? I said, sure, well, what's going on? He said, I have 12 walks I want to audition. 12. 12 different walks. Yeah, and um, he showed me them. I thought two of them were excellent. I said, I love these two. Do you like them? He said, yes. I said, then pick whichever one. And, and um, for his, his movements in, in, as an entrepreneur in Bangalore, three years later, he went out and bought books that he thought Ballroom would buy, mm -hmm. like Seven Habits, Habits of Highly Influential People, and people, yeah. 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 books about power, like Trump, mm -hmm. and a book Trump would write, something that, you know, if you see in the movie, he does do this, which Trump does a lot too, because it's in these books. Yes, it's a power move, yeah. A power move, and he would mansplay when he sat down, you mm -hmm. know, and he, he put his pelvis out as he walked, you know, so yeah, these things. Up his chin as well when he's exactly at that point. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And I, I like that because he said this is what the kind of book Ballroom would have bought to become a leader. You know? Yeah, fascinating. Wow. Yeah, detailed. Um, you uh, you mentioned um, Chop Shop and Man Push Card, and I know that in your early films you often worked with uh, actors who weren't professional actors when you when you cast them. But more recently, you've been working with major stars. Uh, you mentioned Priyanka Chopra Jonas and Rajkumar Rao in this film, Andrew Garfield uh, in Ninety Nine Homes, Zac Efron in At Any Price. Um, do you Mike Shannon, them? Mike Shannon, my favorite. Yes, and Michael Shannon, who was amazing in Ninety Nine yeah. Homes as well. I'm wondering how you adjust, if at all, your approach to directing the actors you work with, whether they're newcomers or professionals, um, Indian stars, uh, Hollywood stars, that kind of thing. Is there a different approach you take? You know, you have to adjust for each actor and what they need and want. Mm -hmm. But in general, what I try to learn from working with non-actors and what I've been implementing more and more with each film is um, some kind of loose freedom on set. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a shot list prepared. I, I have a floor plan. I've talked extensively with my cinematographer and operators about what I think the visual language of the film is going to be, which lenses, what, what mode of camera, studio mode or steady camera, handheld, et cetera. But w once you arrive on the location with the cast um, and you do a private blocking rehearsal, to me, the first thing is just for us to watch this together including the actors, and just to ask ourselves the question, was this any good? Uh, is, it, is this a film we actually should, should film today? Um, and if so, why? And if not, maybe there's a real problem with the scene, or maybe it's just not that interesting of a scene. And wouldn't the producers be happy if we said, we're not filming it? <laughs> um, so you, actually, you give yourself the time to do that every yeah. day? Yes. Amazing. Um, you know, Usually you, you don't end up cutting the scene um, in that moment. You, you usually end up filming it, but often you do make discoveries that no one had ever thought of before. And the number one word on this movie was search. Mm -hmm. So it was a challenge to the actors, to myself, to my core creative team on the set. How can we search for something more today? Is there a way for the actors to interpret the scene that would surprise all of us? Is there a new depth to the scene that none of us ever thought about until we were actually here with the sun the way it is today and the, the props are finally here and the wallpaper's up and they're in a costume. It's, you know, it's game day and maybe we never realized something and you're, you're searching and you're trying to create an environment where not just the actors, the actors, the camera team feel that they can risk and do things. And if it didn't work, it didn't really matter. You would just do another way. And who's to say what doesn't doesn't work right now? Um, and I, I think the actors really, for me, they they blossomed, and to me, they gave me material that I never could have dreamed of on my own, that I never would have understood how to give them a direction to do that, other than you're free to do things, you know. Mm. It's interesting you say that because freedom really strikes me as something that I see in the way stars perform in your film. Um, Priyanka, especially, who's somebody who's you know been at our festival many times and has been a you know great supporter of everything we do, and and but she has a kind of a star persona when she's doing her big you know star driven films. She's she's she in that persona, and it feels like she's kind of stepped out of that for this film. And Rajkumar Rao as well, and 
um, I feel like I'm, I'm seeing new new tones, new notes from some of these stars that, that you know I think I know really well, but somehow there's something new. I'm so glad to hear that, and I'm sure they will be too. Um, I like that a lot, you know. Um, I like to try to create an environment. I mean, you may know this, I'm not sure, but you know, I don't even say action or cut. I've never said that in any of my films. You know, if, if there's a large scene with a lot of moving parts, like a lot of extras or it's a crowd mm -hmm. scene, okay, yes, the AD has to say it because there's so many people moving around. Mm -hmm. But in a, if you're in a room with three, four actors, there's no action or cut on my set, just the camera starts rolling. Mm -hmm. And um, either, either suddenly the actors realize it's rolling and they just start, or they would just be, you know, Cameron, when you're ready. Uh, right. And then there's no cut, you know, um, there's always magic if there's no cut because they don't know what to do exactly, but they know that the camera's still r rolling. Mm -hmm. They have to improvise or they have to go into a contemplative mood. Mm -hmm. And the scene usually ends when I wander into the shot and talk to them. <laughs> Suddenly, the operator. But I like this freedom for the operators too. Yeah. The operators, they know the shot, we've talked about it, but I tell them very, very early in prep, you are the first audience to see this through the your viewfinder. You're holding the camera, you're often inches away from the actor. You have to know the script, you have to understand what's, what the scene is about, and you need to feel the actor. And if I've told you to pan, and when you're shooting it, you feel like I shouldn't pan, I should you know, tilt, or I should go in the other direction, or I should go to the other actor because they've done something. I said, you've got to do it. You've got to feel it and bring me things. Again, bring, bring me a surprise I never thought of. You know, if it doesn't work, it's okay. We will go back and do it the other way. Right. But follow that mood. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, about editing as well. And, I, and now I'm wondering you know, how you find the rhythm of the film. It sounds like some of this, obviously some of it's done in the screenwriting process, but also in uh, on the floor, on the day, when you're finding those moments and figuring out exactly where the, the kind of the energy of the scene is or the emotion of the scene. And that does that determine uh, how you cut the scene when you're in the edit room as well? Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, I've edited four of my films alone and three of them with another editor. In White Tiger, I worked with Tim Strito and he was cutting while I was still shooting and I didn't give him any instructions. And I, I don't like the script supervisor to give him any notes either because I want to know what the editor thinks. Right. I want them to show me what they think. And later I will come and we will, I will sit in my own room and edit and he or she will sit in their room and edit and we will trade the movie back and forth. Script supervisors or directors will sometimes say, you know, take three is the one to, to use or that kind of thing. You don't do any of that until you no. get in. Okay. No, because what if, what if the editor likes to take five? Right. And then shows me the reason why. And I'm like, wow, I never, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. If not, it's okay. I know that I like take three. So the same process on, on the set, if you hire people with the understanding that you want them to bring something to this movie more than more than just accomplishing quote my vision I, I know what my vision is but i want them to enhance that i want them to make it more i want them to bring something to the project then also the crew and the cast become very um emboldened and they feel like they're a part of something and they they know they have to bring their best game to this project because i'm expecting it i i yeah. want them just to do what i said hmm. you know so it's a very collaborative process and um Everybody's bringing something every day. Mm. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the the production, the technical side of filmmaking, which I find fascinating. And you've clearly, you know, developed certain approaches over the course of your films that that work really well. But I want to ask a little bit about just some of the themes that you work with as well. For me, what I often see in your movies is a, this kind of eternal conflict between the profit motive and human empathy. Uh, and, um, you know, the profit motive is a strong one in, in our societies, but uh, somehow human empathy, I think, wins out, which, uh, which is really wonderful and makes your film such a pleasure to watch. Uh, do, you, do you have a sense as an, as an artist, as a filmmaker, of the certain things that you're just drawn to and this, these are the themes you're going to approach, or does that emerge from the films once they're done? Um, 
some things emerge as, as you're working on it, but usually there's an understanding early that I'm drawn to that subject matter. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of what you described. Um, capitalism, let's say, um, um, corrupt systems of power that we all live in, um, which of course includes money and, and, and wealth and a corrupt justice system, a corrupt political system, and how these things impact, let's say, the, the, or the working class um, or um, even, even below working class, let's say, at or below poverty line, um, um, immigrant characters. So basically characters that we don't typically see in movies, mm. uh, Pakistani pushcart vendor, Hispanic kids in a junkyard, a Senegalese cab driver, you know, a, a working class Andrew Garfield getting evicted from his home, you know, to the servant here in, in White Tiger. Um, characters you don't typically aren't, movies aren't made about them, right? Mm. Um, we're seeing a little bit more of that now in the last couple of years, and we're seeing that being embraced in a different way. I think by the industry and by distributors are starting to catch up and realize actually people crave these kind of stories. Um, but, you know, some of that, I appreciate what you said about, about the human empathy and, and searching for the souls in these characters. Um, and around them is something also very brutal, you know, mm -hmm. um, a very brutal system that's around them. And the, the characters, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways become anti-heroes because they're forced to make very tough decisions, as we saw, let's say, in 99 Homes with Garfield's character or in White Tiger. I mean, he becomes commits a murder of a man that even he himself says didn't really fully, you know, maybe didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. um, he wished he had killed the other guy. Mm -hmm. And even then, um, murder is a, uh, you know, is a serious decision. Um, mm. okay. Can I ask you when you first became aware of inequality as something that, that upset you? Um, that, that really bothered you? Did you see it in life around you or was it something that came out from reading or watching movies? How did you become conscious of that first? Uh, I, I think it was really in, in the household. Um, my, both my parents are from Iran, as you know. I was uh, born and raised in North Carolina and my father comes from a very poor background. He comes from a village very similar to the one in the White Tiger. In fact, a lot of the things in the White Tiger for Borom were, in some way I understood them because of my dad. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in Iran for three years and spent a lot of time in those villages in the deep south, Borosju, Dalaki, the small villages. And um, I grew up hearing those stories. Uh, the, I don't want to say just stories of hardship because he always told them laughing and with the humor that goes with them, which I've tried to have in the films, like in Chop Shop, the kids have no, they have no scene, have no understanding that they're poor and they have no pity for themselves. They're just endlessly resilient and joking and laughing. Um, so that, that I understood. And, and my dad is a physician, but he really only worked with working class or low, low economic class people were his patients. Mountain people would come down from the mountain to see him or working class. And so growing up, hearing all that made an impact. And then you started to encounter it, as you mentioned in, in literature, yeah. you know, uh, as a teenager reading Grapes of Wrath was a oh, yeah. Foundation, yeah, foundational book and moment for me to read that. Um, Dostoevsky was always a, you know, probably more than any writer was Dostoevsky was the one that impacted me you know, getting in this, including themes around um, how can one talk about morals when you're hungry and have no bread, mm -hmm. you know? And then really for me, it was living in Iran for three years that kind of helped me understand or, or through whatever mysterious ways the world works, pushed me into the kind of movies that I decided I wanted to make. Um, how old were you when you lived in Iran? I was in, in my early 20s, 23, 24, 25, in that age, in the late 90s. And um, when you were the most idealistic. Yes. Yeah. You're, well, 
I think from teenage years to 30, in that age range, for, personally for me, was when the life and literature and movies impacted me the most. I still read all the time. I watch movies, and they impact me. Uh, they sometimes impact you deeply. But I find that those early ones are the ones that kind of leave a, a deep mark. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. And so the, the living in Iran and the Iranian cinema of Kiarostami, Amir Naderi, Mohsen Nahmal Bof, those made a mark, you know, as well as, let's say, Ken Loach and Paul Laverty's work together and, and, and other, others, uh, so many others, um, that led to making these kinds of films. You know, in, in Dostoevsky, he has very lo long scenes and they're often with lots of characters in one room. And the characters are of such disparate ways of life, rich, poor, generous, miserly, uh, re religious, atheist, uh, um, you know, radical and uh, conformist. And he puts them all in one place. And I, I always wondered in American society, I never encountered these people, you know, mm -hmm. you, unless you force yourself into a situation you don't belong in, you don't meet those people. You just meet the people that are supposed to be in your circle. Yeah. In Iran, I would meet those people daily. Mm -hmm. You were in a day by day basis encountering a wide variety of people from different walks of life. And, um, so when I came back to, to the States, I understood that I don't know how to write scripts from scratch in my apartment. I need to go into the real world to find them. And so researching and meeting people and going into worlds I don't know became my method of inspiration and creativity, meeting push card vendors, spending months in Florida, going on evictions and sitting in the rocket dockets and the courts and spending time in the Iron Triangle for Chop Shop, you know, driving around with this guy owns for goodbye solo, you know, doing the night shift with him for weeks on end in Winston Salem, these kind of activity to meet people and know people and be inspired to write stories. Mm. You know, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking, I can't think of any other American filmmaker who has pierced those boundaries between classes in America. It's often talked about as a class of society. Of course, that's not true, but it's segregated. And as you say, we don't, see each other very often unless we really make an effort um and the way that you've approached that in terms of actually you know not not sitting in a room and writing but actually going in and, and, and sharing an experience with somebody that seems very rare uh in american cinema maybe we're seeing a bit more of it now but i mean was it difficult to chart that path did you feel that you know people kind of didn't know what the hell you were doing when you were first um, it's much, much more difficult is to sit in this room and try to come up with anything by scratch. I, I okay. am always amazed by the writers and directors who can do that. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I'm like, how did they how did they come up with this story? And, you know, <laughs> I don't understand it. I mean, there's always some challenges, but you, you end up finding angels. I mean, you know, every film has an angel that becomes your guide into that world. Mm -hmm. where sometimes there's more than one. Um, and there's also, sometimes there's challenges. What, who are you? Why are you, you know, why are you here? Um, yeah, I mean, a man pushed car it was right after 9-11. So there was still some suspicion. Am I working for the FBI or, or um, am I with the health, health board trying to, you know, say that you're not doing things properly? But a lot of them were Afghans. I could speak to them in Persian. They spoke Pashto. Um, and eventually you, some of them would just say, oh, I'm not going to talk to you. And others open themselves up. Um, so I don't know, I find it the most inspiring and I'm trying to work on a new story now. And during COVID, it was very difficult to meet anyone. So I feel like finally we're getting to a place that um, I can go meet these people that I've been reading about for the last six, seven months. You know? mm -hmm. um, as, as one of the last things I wanna ask you, um, you know, our mission here at TIFF is all about transforming the way people see the world through film. And I think about the persuasive power of your movies, how you are probably opening windows into characters' lives that for a lot of your viewers are worlds they'll never experience directly. They experience that world and, and those, those conflicts and, and those experiences through your movies primarily. 
what do you hear from people who watch your films and maybe starting with White Tiger and working backwards in terms of how it's affected them, how it's changed the, the way they see the world? Well, it's interesting. Um, White Tiger was a completely different phenomenon because um, it was with Netflix and, uh, um, you know, there was a theatrical release, but it was quite limited due to, due to COVID. And, but unlike my other independent films, suddenly it was at 200 million people could watch the film in 200 countries and 35, million, uh, 35 um, languages immediately on the very first day. This is so new and unusual for independent filmmaker to have this. I guess for, it's just new for everyone. And um, so the film was seen, I think they told me conservatively by 60 million people in one month. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Imagine, uh, imagine making this card being seen by even 6 million people. Yeah. So this was incredible. And, and to get either direct messages or messages to get forwarded to someone, to someone to, that eventually gets to you from all over the world, you know, like who knew that this movie was going to be huge in Lagos? Mm. It were endless messages from Nigeria. I can believe it because Lagos is very similar to Mumbai in some ways that, that turn up in your film. Yeah. I, 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 I understand now, you know, <laughs> and now I'm like, I got to go there. Um, yes. It's an incredible. Yeah. Um, Brazil, there were so many messages from Brazil, mm -hmm. um, from, of course, in, 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 in London, in the U S of course, all over South East Asia and the Middle East, there were endless messages from Russia and Korea. There were certain countries that I kept hearing from mm -hmm. and all of them. I remember I got a message from someone I I'm shooting a documentary and there's someone on the crew that I don't know very well because he, he's more in, in, um, in an office and we're all working remotely. He sent me a message saying, um, I'm from Mexico. I grew up in Mexico and I grew up poor. How did you know this is what it's like? Yeah. You know? And I was like, wow, you know, that was impactful to hear that. Um, I work with someone for years. She's from um, Zimbabwe and she watched the film with her mom and her aunties and all of them said, this is Zimbabwe. Yeah. You know, so hearing that and hearing that people felt that it had been about them or their country um, or an experience they had had was made me feel I got something right, that Arvind really nailed it in the novel. Mm -hmm. And then let's say for people who didn't have that experience or in the Western world, the idea that there's so many ball runs on our phone. Yes. You know, there's a Rolodex of servants that we can access now in the Western world at any time. Mm -hmm. Steamless, Uber, you know, um, task grab. Mm -hmm. This gig economy that is basically servants. And, and, and you know, these anti-labor movements that are happening, this anti... I mean, just now, again, they cannot pass a $15 minimum wage in America. They just, the, the unions, they just voted against unionizing for Amazon. Uh, okay, we know a lot of how that happens, right? Through, again, systems of corruption that encourage people not to unionize um, or convince people that gig work is actually beneficial in some way um, without informing them of the, the pitfalls of it, which of course Ken Loach and Paul Laverty showed us so brilliantly in their film. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the understanding that these ballroom exists in the Western world too, and I think it's growing and it's going to become a bigger and bigger character in our in our Western world. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit about how there seems to be a, a bit of a shift in terms of our awareness. There's been so much that's changed along with the pandemic in terms of uh, social consciousness in the last year or so with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the movement against uh, Asian hate and, and different things that are that are happening in terms of, you know, where you start from as a filmmaker and the stories you want to tell and how you do address uh, uh, inequality. Uh, do you feel like it's a more receptive landscape or could become a more receptive landscape for the stories you want to tell? It seems to be. Yeah. I mean, as we mentioned, almost in the beginning of our talk today, um, I don't think anyone would have given me the budget that I had to make this movie. 15 years ago or even five years ago. I mean, this was a huge epic story that it took me 60 days to shoot. So that's not inexpensive and Netflix was prepared to do it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think this would have happened um, well, even maybe not even three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and look at the look at the list of these amazing films that are being nominated this year, and how many of them are about challenging subjects. Yes. Uh, films that I don't know they would have played at TIFF. You know, they would have had an awesome art house run, as many of my early films did. But I don't think they would have reached this level of public awareness even four or five years ago, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Um, and uh, I know we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you what else you're working on. You mentioned a documentary. Are there other projects that you have on the go that you can share? Well, oh, I'm uh, I'm working on a, a TV project that is based on a novel that's very close to me. So I'm, I'm hoping I can launch that. Or it's just kind of coming together. And it's something I've been following for a decade and waiting to see if the rights would come available again. And so we're seeing if we're going to be able to launch that. And then I've set up um, our Arvin's new book. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. At, at um, Netflix, which is about an uh, illegal immigrant in Sydney, a mm -hmm. Sri illegal immigrant in Sydney who, who um, cleans homes for a living and hears about a murder one morning. And he, he knows the woman that was murdered and he believes he knows who murdered her. But if he turns the man in, he's worried he will be deported. Right. So in a very kind of one electrifying day, he has to figure out if he's going to, what he's gonna do and, and does a human being who has no rights in this world have any moral obligations? Mm -hmm. And then I have one original script I'm working on, yeah. That's great. Can't wait to see what's next. And and um, thanks again for The White Tiger and all the films over the years. But I, I'm glad to have had a chance to see this twice recently. I'm going to share it with my son, who's turning 12 next week very soon. So he's primed to watch that, too. Oh, I, I hope he will watch Plastic Bag. Oh, yes, right. Yeah, the short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love when kids see plastic bag. Okay, I'm going to show I'm going to make that the kind of the preview for um, for um, White Tiger as well. And Cameron, I, I have also want to tell you, which I mentioned to you earlier about some films I'm producing now. Mm -hmm. um, I produced a film for my former editor and assistant editor, Alex Camilleri. He's Maltese American and he had his debut film, Lutsu, which is the name of the traditional fishing boat in Malta. And he spent two, three years working with real fishermen and he cast real fishermen in the lead. And it's an incredible film. And um, I produced a new new film, the second film I produced for Alexander Morado, who's a Brazilian American director. And he has a new film coming, I hope this fall, he's just finishing it, um, which he shot in Brazil about modern human day, modern uh, human slavery in Brazil. And it's a really compelling film. And so I'm, I'm Excited to work with these young directors on their on their work now too. Yeah, no, I can't wait to see those as well. And listen, thank you for not just the films that you're directing and writing, but the, the space you're opening up for other filmmakers to tell these stories as well. I mean, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Great to see you, Cameron. Thanks. All right. Bye bye.